Praise the Lord. Quick note to the guys in the sound booth. For some reason, my little box is not working this morning, so we're going to have to rely on the old, the old method. But praise God. I appreciate the things that have been shared. I appreciate the Lord's burden. And I just I pray the Lord will direct my thoughts. I've had thoughts going back for days now, and we'll just I, I believe it plays into what has been said. I believe with all my heart the Lord is wanting to equip his people and bring us to a place where we are effective, where we can truly help one another, where that's, that's the focus of our lives. We understand the kingdom of God and how it works. You know, we talked last week about the condition of the world and the last rebellion and how we're seeing that unfold. We're seeing the, the spirit of man who is all about himself, his pleasure, his pride, everything to do with himself and everything that would repel everything God stands for in, in, uh, in the pursuit of selfish interests. But I tell you, God has called us out of that world and he's called us to a kingdom. And more than we realize, we're affected by the world in which we live. I think we all know that. And I'd like to read some uh, familiar scripture, but I believe always the Lord has a particular way he wants, to, a particular thing he wants to emphasize. And he emphasized this to my own heart and my own mind in a slightly different way from a scripture that I was very familiar with. I'm just going to go ahead and read a few scriptures, verses rather, in 1 Peter chapter 5. And Peter is writing here, he begins, To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. And there we come back to the song or the scripture that was the inspiration for the chorus that we began to service with. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. We've even ministered in the past upon this scripture where we say, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. And I feel like the danger, perhaps in my own past thinking and uh, in, our, in our way of looking at this, we tend to think of our spiritual life as us and God. And it's, a, it's almost a private thing. I need to have a certain humble attitude toward God, realizing He is greater than I am. He knows better than I do. He's able to arrange the circumstances of my life. And so I need to humble myself and be thankful and recognize His goodness in the spite of things that I may not like, but it basically is, is a kind of a vertical relationship. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, how many of you have kind of thought about this th that way? Well, I'll tell you, when you look at this in the context, it certainly involves that, but I don't believe that's what it's about at all. In fact, I was thinking about what to call this, and I, and I didn't start with this as I imagined I would, but I will trust the Lord with how this comes out. But it would be this simple phrase, and it's a, it's a phrase we hear in advertising for the U.S. Army, if I'm not mistaken, be all you can be. And, you know, the world conceives of that as you need to dig down deep, you need to, you know, assert yourself and develop your abilities to the greatest degree, and, of course, the Army is selling themselves as that's the way to make it happen, but, you know, whether that is or, is or isn't the case, but I'll tell you what, we serve a God who wants us to be all we can be. But we need to understand what that means. Because it doesn't mean what the world means by that. We do not become all that we can be by asserting self. It's exactly the opposite. But you know how this works out in practice? It isn't just me and Jesus on the Jericho Road trying to learn how to say, Yes, Lord, and I agree with you, and I'm humbling myself and all of that. 
Do you know where this works out? It works out on horizontal relationships. Do you know God has an order to his kingdom? We, we see just a glimpse of it in the early part of this passage. God has an order. We're not all the same. Every one of us has been given certain gifts, certain abilities, certain, a certain place that God has designed just for you, just, just for every single one of us. There's nobody who's unimportant, even though some may be over others in, in the way their gifts operate. It's never with this selfish, it's I'm better than you, I'm more important than you, never with any of that kind of a spirit. Now, look, just go back into, into what we began with. He's talking to elders. He's talking to people who have a responsibility to watch over. He says be overseers, doesn't he? So there's a leadership there. There's a role that's being carried out through people. It's God's oversight. Ultimately, he's the, great over, he's the great shepherd, isn't he? He's the one who's over all, but he uses others. He works through others to, work, to, to rule over. Not rule is, is a bad word, but you understand what I'm saying, to, to have leadership over others. But look at the character of that leadership. He says, not because you must, but because you are willing. Now, what, what, what's the contrast there? You're talking about somebody who is so self-willed, he says, all I care about is myself. I don't care about those poor sheep. I don't care about watching over them. I've got my own life to live. Do you see the contrast between the spirit of Christ and the spirit of selfishness? But what about the greedy part? How many people are in religious positions today and you watch their lives and you see how they live them out and it's greed. It's greedy for pride, it's greed for money, it's all kinds of things that just pollute the name of Jesus and bring dishonor to him because they do it in his name. But this is the, the polar opposite of what God wants his people to seek. It's not what I can get, it's what I can give. It's what God has empowered me because he has designed me for a certain purpose and when I yield my vessel to him and when he operates by his spirit through my members, and I'm, I'm saying this of everyone, then I have the power to bless somebody, though in myself I could never do that. If you got what's in me, you'd be messed up. But if I have the privilege of standing here and, and yielding myself in any measure to the Lord, obviously this is a process of, of getting more and more mature, more able to be used. Exactly what Thomas was talking about. You know, that's one aspect of it, is caring and, and giving of yourself and focusing on the needs of somebody else in prayer. That's, that's a powerful way this works out. But, uh, you know, I, how do I see myself? Is it just me and my little world and my little life? Is it about me and what I can get? Or is it what I have the privilege of giving? You see, what is God's nature? What is the, what is the very life, the character of his kingdom? But it's God's spirit. And God's character infuses everything that is a part of his kingdom. Can you imagine? We've talked about this before. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when it's all there is? Every flower, every bird, every creature, every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, if there are any, <laughs> if we're not all the same at one point. But you understand what I'm saying? Every fiber of everyone's being is infused with a, with a principle of love with a principle of peace, of joy, of purpose. Talk about being all we can be. This is the pathway. It's not the pursuit of self. It's losing our lives and giving them to him and allowing his nature to take control and to, and to work through us for the benefit of others because that's his focus. You know, as, a, as a, an example we uh, have used before from 1 John 4, I think, where it talks about how God's love is made perfect or made complete. Well, think about that. God loves us. He's demonstrated that by, the, by what Jesus did on the cross. It's a practical thing. He, he did something that was the only answer to our need. We had no hope of, of ever having a relationship with a holy God unless God did something to, deal, to do away with the barrier of our sins. He's demonstrated his love. So how is that love complete? Now, we would tend to say, well, he loves me, I'm going to love him back. Well, that's true enough, but that's a private thing. But God's love is made perfect when we love one another. It's not meant to be just a bounce back thing. This is meant to uh, be a river that flows through and out and permeates whatever it touches. And, of course, when his love flows through us to somebody else, 
and they open their hearts to it, that's God's love for them. What do they do? In turn, they're, they're opening their vessel and allowing that, lo that life to flow. And one day, that's all there will be. Yeah. Oh, man, that's where we're going. Doesn't we, don't we want to participate in that now? Isn't that what this is about? Yeah. It's about the kingdom of God and his will being done on earth as it's done in heaven. Well, it's not, we're not going to see this world transformed. This world is going to be destroyed, ultimately. And I don't believe it's that far off. But nonetheless, God's kingdom is real. Jesus is real. He is on the throne and he is working in the hearts and lives of all of his people. I want to be one of those people, don't you? So you see the spirit of this. But here's something that, that jumped out at me a number of years ago. It says, young men, in the same way, be submissive. Now, he's just talked about leaders. He's talked about people who are leaders over others, and now he's talking about, in the same way, be submissive. That doesn't compute to a human mind. We think of leaders as people who would gain power for themselves and use that power often selfishly or use it to lord it over, the very thing he says not to do, to lord it over others and, and command them and put them down and put them in an inferior place. This is the very opposite. What he's saying is leadership is a form of submission. It's submitting my own private life and my, wor my world for the benefit of somebody else because of gifts that God has given to me. He didn't give them to me to make me something. He gave them to me to, to allow me to participate in his very life and his very nature for the benefit of somebody else. But he did that for you too. But what's the price here? What, what's involved? It's a spirit of submission, isn't it? It's being willing to take the place that God has designed for you and for me. How many, do you really believe that God is, knows about you and he's designed you for a particular place in your kingdom, in his kingdom? I do. There's a place only you can fill. God put you there. He gave you every gift that you need to flourish. And that's his design. He wants every member of the body of Christ to be all that you can be. Praise God. I don't know, I don't want to just give this out with emotion, but somehow it just really captured my, my imagination. I saw, I saw this in a way that just, I hadn't really seen it quite before. And yet it does pull together ideas that we've heard. Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. This gets down to personal attitudes. This gets down to our relationships one with another. Do we have this, nobody tells me what to do, spirit? You know, if you don't come to the end of that fundamentally and come to Christ and bow the knee, you're not even part of this. There's got to be a, there's got to be a laying down of our life and embracing and, and inviting him to come in and be the Lord and wash away our sins and all of that. But I'll tell you, just because that's happened doesn't mean all the other just goes away. We're still infected with, a, with the influence of this world and our old nature. It rises up and, and boy, do we have self-will. Ooh, we want our way. Our way's right, after all. You know, we all go through this. But you understand what I'm saying? You see what, how God is wanting this to work out in every area of our lives. And we're, if we are truly uh, submitting to God, which is where he's going, is humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, how does that happen? Is it possible for me to have a humble spirit before God and not to have a humble spirit towards you? Uh-uh. But I can kid myself, can't I? I can live in this little private world and imagine that I'm so spiritual. I've got this wonderful, glorious relationship. And all those poor schmucks out there that don't quite get it, you know, I'll be real impatient with them and short with them. No, it doesn't work that way. God wants his spirit reproduced in us. And the way that works is the relationships that exist among his people. Because you and I are not the only ones. We've got brothers, I mean, right here, we've got, a, we've got a company of brothers and sisters. And I'll tell you, God wants to produce a unity, a humbleness of spirit one to another where we're not just bickering and fighting for our way and criticizing and all the negative things that come out of human nature. God wants us to humble ourselves and realize 
Most of the time when there's any kind of problem, we're the problem. And of course, I know in your case it's different. <laughs> Couldn't possibly be any other way because you're right. Boy, the devil's slick. He has so many ways of justifying our acting in a way that's exactly the opposite of what the writer is talking about, what the Lord through the writer is talking about. Because we value, we, are, we sort of imagine that the, the greatest value that we could uphold is being right. And of course, it gets down to stupid stuff sometimes. Which way do you hang the toilet paper? How do you squeeze the, do you squeeze or roll the toothpaste? Tube. You know what I'm talking about. But I mean, sometimes it gets down to a whole lot of other stuff. But I mean, how we stupidly assert our rightness. But oh, when it comes to something we have a conviction about. I'm not talking about whether we rob a bank or not. You know, understand what I'm saying. But when we come down to so many issues in our lives, we've got a conception in our pumpkin heads of what's right. And that becomes the highest value. And so Satan has a way of justifying a rotten spirit. How many times over the years have we heard it said rightly, you are wrong, even if you're right, if your spirit is wrong? Now, the problem is, so many of the times, we're not even right. <laughs> but suppose, for the sake of argument, you really are. Does that justify asserting that old nature to try to make that happen somehow. No, it doesn't. God is more concerned with our heart and our spirit and our attitude than any other thing. If he sees someone who humbles himself to something that is technically wrong, again, you know, I'm not talking about somebody who says, let's go rob a bank. Okay. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. You understand? And we can even have a, a, a right spirit in not participating in something that we know is wrong. But I'll tell you, God is more interested in your attitude and mine. A humble spirit, if he sees that, even in the face of something that's wrong, does he not observe that? Does he not know? Does he not care? Will he not honor that one? Will he not even work through that circumstance to produce the fruit of a spirit? that is able to do that when it matters? I'll tell you, when God can mold that kind of a spirit and character into us, he's got someone to work with. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Because he says it's not just the young submitting to the older, it's everybody being humbled about everybody. So he really stops and says, you know, I've talked about a lot of specifics, but this really applies to everybody. We need to have a humble, caring spirit towards one another that's not quick to fight for our way and our ideas and our this and our that. Oh, how, God, how wise the Lord is to put us together, knowing, <laughs> you know, we're like the rough stones in a tumbler. The Lord's going to tumble us around and, rough, and move all, get rid of all the rough edges. Well, I'm afraid I got plenty, and I think you do too. But no, you do. No. There's so many scriptures that you could use on this, but I'm just going to go back to some that, that get into specifics. First of all, that back in, in chapter 2, verse 9, there is a uh, kind of a, a summary of where God's going and who we are, and then it kind of unfolds in some of these other issues. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Why? that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Declare is more than just talking about it. Declaring is manifesting. God wants, uh, wants the world to be able to look at us and interact with us and see something of him in us. That's what he's talking about. So he's called us out of the darkness we've been talking about into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world 
to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing things wrong or doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now let's see how some of this works out. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men. Now think about the world in which this was uttered and written. This was a world ruled by a pagan emperor in Rome who was seriously cruel. In fact, the one who wrote this probably wasn't all that long before he was crucified. You had the Jews who were just about to be destroyed because of their, the nation as a whole was destroyed because of the resistance and the failure to recognize their Messiah and their rejection of him. And then you had a pagan world that was full of cruelty. And here God says, submit yourself? You've got to be kidding. But do you see what God is seeking to produce? He's seeking to produce a heart that sees past all of this and says, God, I want to be the kind of a person you want me to be. You have allowed me to be in this circumstance. And you have allowed me to live at this time, in this, in, under these circumstances. Lord, I want to be the kind of a person you want me to be. I want to have the right attitude. Boy, is there, do we live in a world today that is full of, of hate, full of anger about, on, on all sides. There's an anger that is, that is gripping our nation. And it's awfully easy to get involved in that and say, Oh, you know, you're a stupid idiot. Why do you say that? You know, instead of saying, Lord... Help me to be the kind of person you want me to be. Help me to see past all of this and see, see people and care about people. Every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. Slaves. See, there was still slavery here. Now, you could talk in terms of, of a, an employer-employee relationship, right, if you want to, in today's world. But slaves... Submit yourselves to your masters with all respect. Not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. Boy, there's no wiggle room here, is there? He doesn't say, as long as they do right, I'll submit, I'll go along. No, you're not the boss. God is, God is forming his character. You're going to see in a minute where this, how this was really portrayed for all of us. But also to those who are harsh, for it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you, do, if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? Oh, how noble we are. We mess up and we just patiently, humbly receive the good grief, big deal. You deserve it. But what he's, what he's commending here is somebody who doesn't deserve something, and they take it with a humble, a humble spirit. God takes note of that. God is, God is changing something on the inside. It's not just a bunch of rules and religion, is it? This is a character change. This is a character transplant, if you will. Okay? To this you were called. You, uh, down in verse 20. What is that, 21? Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Now, here's the ultimate example. He committed no sin. Anybody here can claim that? You are absolutely perfect and pure. Nobody can be justified in treating you badly because you're so holy. Well, he was. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. 
Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Kind of came out all right, didn't it? He went through all of that, but where is he now? He's on the throne of the universe, folks. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Now he gets into some... He really goes to meddling here, doesn't he? Chapter 3, the beginning of it. Wives, whoa. In the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of... Now, here's the thing. Just stop there. Man, is that... How much a part of our culture is that? They hate it. There is a spirit of called feminism or, or women's lib or whatever you call it that is fundamentally a rebellion against God. But, it, but what they're rebelling against is a, is a myth. That if we were to follow this book, it means women are to be subjected and, and subjugated and made second, third class and treated badly and all of that. I think we're going to see as we go along, God has exact opposite in mind. Exact opposite. But still, if God has made you a woman, you are special in his eyes, but you have a particular place in his kingdom. You have been invested with certain gifts that are of great value to him, great value to everybody. Why? But here's the thing. In the same way, be submissive to your husbands. Now, here's the case that he's talking about here. This is not just a good guy. This is not just somebody who's a fellow Christian and walking with the Lord. This is somebody who's doesn't believe, so that if any of them do not believe the word, may they be won over without words. Ladies, you listening to this one? So many of our ladies, bless their hearts, were vaccinated with a phonograph needle. Sorry, I couldn't resist that. Some of you don't even know what a phonograph needle is. So. Many of you. I'm dating myself. But anyway, seriously. So that they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. What is it that God is wanting this man to see from the woman? Does he want her to say, look, I'm a Christian. I know what's right. Bless God. Here's, here's God's word. No. What will win him is seeing the transformation in her character. You know, I've mentioned a couple of times this, the movie that's coming up. That I, I still don't know if it's going to be here or not, but we're going to see it one way or another. And that's the case for Christ, where this man who was such a rabid atheist, his wife suddenly comes to the Lord, and he's, he's just thrown, he's rocked by it. And he sets out to disprove the resurrection. Finds out he can't. But what ultimately really turned the tide was the change he saw in his wife. It wasn't that she got him by the lapel and started preaching to him. It was the change in her character. He saw the life of God and the life of Christ manifest through her life. And it just, it won him. God used that. I'll tell you, the, the women of our day have a power you have no idea, but it isn't exercised the way the world tells you to do it. And I'll tell you, this is, this is an area where the enemy wants to try to really mess up earthly relationships, homes. Why do you think the home is under such attack in our world today? The devil knows that it is fundamental to human society. God established the home. He made them male and female. He declared that they, the father would, uh, the husband, or the man would leave his father's house and be married to his wife. They would become one flesh. And you follow it through the scriptures and you see that God meant there to be a union that would produce, that would reproduce his kingdom. There is an order there that, that rightly entered into is, is awesome. 
It's meant to be a, a, a microcosm of the kingdom of God. And I'll tell you, Satan will invade homes when women start getting out of their place. I don't have anybody in mind. I'm just, I just sense that there's always a need for this. Because the world will tell you it isn't that way. And, oh, God, this isn't right. I've got to fix it. I'm the spiritual one. I'm, you know, there's a thousand and one excuses for someone not to do what God says. And all it is is unbelief. And it's an exercise of the spirit of the old nature. But God has a way of working in and through the lives of godly women that is powerful, that is awesome. And he wants you to be all you can be. You'd be surprised. I'm going to read something I, I trust later that will really highlight this in a very special way. So they may be won without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Now, you know, some people take this and try to make a legalistic standards for, for, for dress. That's not what this is about. It means the focus of your heart is to be what God wants you to be. I mean, it doesn't mean you can't wear, you know, you can't wear earrings or something, some ridiculous, you can't go take that to an extreme. But I'll tell you, if that's what you're depending on, if your whole way of living and trying to present yourself to the world is through what you can do with yourself outwardly, you're missing what he's talking about here. God wants a beauty in you, but it's a beauty that comes from in here. Listen to what he says about that. Instead, it should be that of your inner self. The unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is of great worth in God's sight. You want to know how God sees you? Man, he looks down and he sees a lady with that kind of a heart and that kind of a spirit. Man, there's something in his heart that leaps. There's something in heaven that rejoices. You want to know who's, who, who is important in his kingdom? There may be all kinds of people. There may be some lady down there that really exhibits the heart and the life of Christ. She doesn't preach. She doesn't buttonhole people, but she lives out the life of Christ. And the Lord would say, that's what I'm looking for. That's what I value. That's what will be honored. Great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God. Now you see where their, see where their hope is. If you're, if you're trying to fix situations, if you're trying to fix relationships by asserting self, your hope isn't in God. Your hope is in you and your ability to fix things and your rightness in doing it. No one here has ever fallen into that trap, have you? But you see, where the, you see the contrast he's drawing here. Put their hope in God. They used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. Ooh. Fighting words. Well, the reason they're fighting words is because we have a human conception of what it means to, to have a master and what how they behave. We see them as selfish tyrants who use their mastery, if you will, to abuse and to put down and to repress and to keep somebody from being all they can be. Now, I'll tell you, that kind of mastery isn't what you want. But there still is that spirit that looks and says, this is my place. God has put me here. I, I am equipped for this place that God has put me, and it's an important place. And I'm going to occupy it. I'm going to trust him. I'm, I'm going to see past circumstances and personalities. I'm going to honor him. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Now, let's look at the other side of the equation. Husbands in the same way. Now, again, isn't that interesting? He keeps saying in the same way, in the same way. You're, you're carrying through this sense of being submissive to God, of humbling yourself under God's hand, of being a, having a humble spirit one towards another. So how does, a, how does that work out for a husband since he is in a position of headship? In the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect 
as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life and nothing will hinder your prayers. Talk about praying. When you follow other scriptures that talk about the husband and his place, man, God has invested you with gifts. How do we use those gifts? Do we use them selfishly to abuse and to dominate? Or do we use them to create an environment in which those under that influence can flourish and be all they can be? You see where God's going with this? You see, I mean, you see the end game. You see where he's going with it. But isn't that what he wants to reproduce here and now as we learn his ways and we humble ourselves under his mighty hand? It's going to mean a lot of saying no. It's going, to, it's going to mean a man saying no to his selfish desires and say, I'm, I'm laying down my life for you. Isn't that what Ephesians 5 says? It says, wives, submit to your husbands, but it also says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that he might make her. And all of that, everything is, is poured out. All the gifts that God has given him have given her a, a, a realm to live in and flourish. That's where God wants it. That's how God wants it to work. You see how these relationships are meant to work? And I'll tell you, to the degree this works, in, works out in, uh, in a home, what about kids? I'll tell you, a Christian home is not one with just a bunch of rules. A Christian home is where God's life is modeled in the, in the husband and wife and their relationship, where they see what it means to be a man. They see... Not somebody who's domineering and, and oppressive, but someone who loves and gives and, and just uses his abilities to, to nurture and to, bring, and to bring into full flower the other one. And she uses the gifts God's given her. And together, they see a picture of what the kingdom of God is like. And yes, there's a whole lot of rule laying down in some respects. You've got to, you've got to teach discipline. You've got to bring them up. But it has got to always be in that kind of a spirit. But, you know, you're, you, this kid's here today. What does the world teach you? What does the world teach you is be your attitude? Nobody tells me what to do. It's a permissive society. If you're, if you're a parent, you have no right to hinder their development. You stand off. In fact, they don't even belong to you. They belong to the state. Don't repress them. Let them express themselves. Yeah, express themselves right into hell. God loves his children. God wants them to come to a place where they're willing to do what the Scripture says and obey their parents. What is your attitude toward them? I'll obey them if they're right. I'll obey them if they do what I want. No, there is a spirit that God wants to produce in you while you're young. You learn the principle of submission. Ultimately, it's to him. You learn how to respect your place and respect authority. And what you're really doing is, is stepping into a place in the kingdom of God. It's a place of blessing. You want to be under the shadow of the Almighty? You want to be in that place where his, his covering is over you? And he's working in your life and preparing you for what, what's to come? This is the pathway. It's exactly the opposite of what the world teaches. But oh, I, I, I don't know. Somehow I just, this just captured my, my attention this week. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. And he goes on and talks about how the Lord's you know, called us to a place of blessing. There's so many things. I mean, I think of, I just refer to Romans chapter 12, where he talks about presenting yourselves as a living sacrifice. And he moves right from that transformation of our thinking into the body of Christ and how we, every one of us has a gift. Every one of us has gifts. What are those gifts given to us for? Yeah, they are given to us as abilities by which we can bless others. Everybody here is called to a place where you have the power to bless me and to bless everybody else. And it's, it's not a, it's not a we, we think we have a hierarchy so easily. Oh, this one is important, this one doesn't matter. 
In God's kingdom, everyone matters. We serve a God who clothes the lilies of the field, who sees the sparrow fall. Didn't, he say, didn't Jesus say, if he, if he takes such care with the lilies of the field, won't he take care of you? But do you see how God's value system is so desperately different from everything the world is teaching us? I tell you, God wants to bring his people together in such a way where we can be so set free from selfish living, thinking, acting, to where he can invest in us gifts that will, that will bless others. Think about what God said in, back in chapter 5 of 1 Peter. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, why? To what end? That he may lift you up in the proper time. You see, God is wanting us to be all we can be, but he knows that if we live selfishly the way the world does, we'll never be that. He didn't create us to live that way. You, know, you think about the genders. We were talking about husbands and wives. And I'll go back to this simple principle. God made us in his image. He made us male and female. Did not make men to be men or women and vice versa. He invested our ladies with a portion of his own nature and character. There are gifts, there are things that they are gifted to do that men cannot do. But the same is true on the other side of the equation. God has invested certain areas of his character and his nature and his ability in men. And when they operate in the proper relationship that he has designed, man, you get the whole picture. You get the nature of God being manifested through a relationship. Isn't that exactly what, what the Word te teaches? Anybody here got room for growth in this area? Yeah. Oh, may God help us to, to recognize and, and, and humble ourselves under his mighty hand. That means if you're a wife and you're inclined to be kind of stubborn and mouthy and wanting your way and digging in, are you really humbling yourself under God's mighty hand? He put you there. Do you don't think he cares about issues? Oh, but this, is, this issue is so important. That's a devil's trick. God knows about issues. He can let something happen that is wrong but if it accomplishes something in your spirit, he can turn it around and make it, make it something of eternal value. Every place, whether, we're, whether it's a position in the body of Christ, whatever it is, every one of us is servant to everybody else. And there are gifts God has given you that are unique to you. And God wants them set free. He wants you to be all you can be. I want to go back and just read something that, I mean, there's so many things you could bring into this. But I thought of a scripture that, I don't know if anybody's thought of this. I, I had never put this together. But turn to the last chapter of Proverbs. I've sort of referred to this recently. But this touches on this issue of the place of women. Because it's a real hot button issue in our, in our society. Feminists think that they're, they're, they've got to assert their rights, their, their superiority. They've got to demasculate men or emasculate men. And, uh, you know, well, you know the spirit. You see it. But now we have a description in verse 10. A wife of noble character who can find. Now, right off the bat, it tells you this is, a, this is a, an ideal woman. There's, there's, no, there's no such person. But, but what you get out of this is what does God value? Let's, let's find out what a, what a noble character, well, a woman of noble character is like. She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still dark. She provides food for her family and portions for her servant girls. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. 
In her hands she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. Making cloth, I guess. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. I'll drop this in. I, I have a, a sister who has four daughters, and they had a family joke when they were growing up, and they would sit around the dinner table at night, and, and my sister would cook a particularly good meal the four, four daughters would, would, in unison, at the end of the meal, rise up and say, blessed. <laughs> so they rose up and called her blessed. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive. Here's a, here's a point of, uh, that's important. Perspective. Charm is deceptive. Beauty is fleeting, doesn't last. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the reward she has earned and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Now, does that sound like a repressed woman? That sound like someone who's just living a menial, uh, you know, life as a more, of a more of a slave, a second class? No. This is a woman who is flourishing within the role that God has designed for her, everything she touches is blessed. Her life touches everybody in a wonderful, positive way. Ladies, do you have, have any idea the power you have? If God gets a hold of those things. And men, do we watch over our, our ladies and, and allow them to flourish? Or are we selfish and is it all about us and what we can get? Man, this... You sense something in this. This, this woman, this lady's husband is not sitting there. He, he trusts in her. He's learned that her character is, is something that he can just rely upon. And he's not sitting there looking over her shoulder and second-guessing every little thing and, and repressing her. There is a freedom that she has to express what God has given to her. And you notice that she's not trying to be a man. She's not trying to be anything that she isn't, but what she is is being all that she can be. And that's awesome. That's awesome. Do you see where God is, how God is putting some of this together? Oh, my God, help us to humble ourselves to the place that he has called us. You may be in a place where you, you're working for somebody and it's not always pleasant. They don't always treat you right. What's God looking for from you? That you serve God. You do your work as unto the Lord. You honor him with your attitude and God will form character in you that will bring you to a place of maturity where he can flow through your life and touch. There's no telling what he can't do. But oh, if we're just constantly bucking against him, or we're bucking against this situation, or you're bucking against your parents, I want my way or you're bucking against your husband and wife, or whatever the relationship is, sisters or brothers in the church, who are we bucking against? Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. Now, he's going to lift you up in due time. Now, what does that mean? Okay, I've done my dues now that everybody's going to think I'm wonderful and spiritual. No. God is going to lift up those who humble themselves and allow their character be to be changed. But it's not going to be them that's going to be exalted. It's going to be Christ because Christ can flow through them. And all the gifts, the wonderful things that he has designed you to be, you can be all that you can be, and suddenly the river of God's life is flowing through you to the people in your life in the realms that you touch. And God is glorified and people's lives are transformed. What else is going to do it? 
And then I'll come back to where, where Thomas started. Prayer is certainly part of this, isn't it? What do we do? Do we criticize or do we pray? Do we become vessels through which God's, the river of God's life can go out and, and, fit and address situations and needs because there's a, we see ourselves as their servants rather than their critics? Yeah, you see areas where we, we need to grow. But I believe God wants to give us a sense and a vision of what it means to be the body of Christ. You know, we see the picture in, in Ephesians 2 of God building a temple, don't we? And what does it say of that temple? It's fitly framed together. What does that mean? It means everybody's got a particular place. You don't just throw it together haphazardly. There's every, God has designed a place in his kingdom for you. And he's shaping you to fulfill that. It, we will ultimately, but I'll tell you, God wants it here. God wants to form his character in his people here and make of us such a, such a spirit of unity. It will not be a unity where somebody at the top commands it. That's another thing I want to really emphasize. Spiritual authority is not repressive. It's not a dominion authority. Notice he tells the leaders, don't lord it over, but he tells the younger, submit yourselves. You see where the submission comes from? It comes from the one in whose heart God is working. It is voluntary. It is, I see God in this. I see God's hand. I see God's purpose. And in submitting to my place in the order of things, I'm submitting to God, and I do it willingly. See, even Jesus didn't berate people who left him. He said to his own disciples, would you also go away? There's that sense of a trust of God working in the heart so that whatever obedience, whatever unity was offered was a fruit of what God had done in the heart. Oh, may we offer our hearts to him. May we present ourselves to him to change the way we think and the way we see ourselves in our place. I tell you, those women, I mean, men, you've got a place of authority. How do you use it? You have an awesome place of creating, with God's help, an environment in which your family can flourish, and they can become all that they are. Oh, I'll tell you. And here's the other thing. We can't do this, can we? <laughs> but what does he say? Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. He will lift you up at the proper time. Why? God resists the proud, but what does he do for the humble? He gives grace, doesn't he? That means I have the right in obeying God, in submitting myself to him, myself to him, to expect that he will give me the ability to do what he has told me to do. So then it becomes a sense of, yes, I am yielding to him in the sky in that sense, but I am expressing it here. And I'll tell you, when it all comes into, into play, God has a home. God is building a house. He's building a home to live in. What kind of a home do we, are we presenting him right now? Is there disunity? Is there, are there crossed up spirits? You see how all this plays in? I'll tell you, God wants, to, wants us to first look in the mirror and say, God, help me to be the kind of a person you want me to be in my relationships. To see past fault, because we all got them, see past all of those things and say, Lord, I just want to, be your, I want to be the kind of person you are. I want to be the kind of person my Lord was when he stood before the world and he laid down his life, though he was innocent. I want to have that same kind of spirit because I see past all of that. I get it. Lord, you're in charge. You're fitting me for eternity. I'm just passing through you. I'm a, I'm a stranger and a pilgrim. I'm an alien here. Isn't that what Peter said? I'll tell you, God, what God has planned for us, the lifting up part, you have no idea. I talked about the, the evil of the world and said you ain't seen nothing yet. I'll say it of this. We ain't seen nothing yet. To see and to experience what God has planned for every one of us, how he has created us in wisdom, invested us with, with abilities we cannot even imagine. They've been hijacked by sin and rebellion. But as God purges that out of our lives, his nature is going to begin to be able to be expressed through us. And it's going to be amazing. Let's begin right now where we're at.
and look to him and give him the glory. Praise God.